Thanks, Drew. I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar, a discussion by researchers and practitioners who were involved in an initiative that led to the recently published report, Designing for Engagement, the Experiences of Tweens in the Boys and Girls Club's Youth Arts Initiative. We have several presenters on today's call from different organizations, including Wallace Foundation, Research for Action, McClanahan Associates, and Boys and Girls Clubs. So I wanna start with some quick introductions. I'm Peter Rogovin, I'm with the Wallace Foundation and I'm the project director and also the author of the Something to Say report. We have Amy Goodall Douglas from Research and Evaluation at the Wallace Foundation. Our two principal investigators, Wendy McClanahan from McClanahan Associates and Tracy Hartman from Research for Action. And Ben Perkovich, the director of Clubhouse Operations for Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Green Bay and Vidal Hill, an artist from, a teaching artist from Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Milwaukee and both Green Bay and Milwaukee were, uh, they were two of the three clubs involved uh, in our uh, initiative. So just a quick overview on the Wallace Foundation, our mission at the Wallace Foundation is to foster improvements in learning and enrichment for disadvantaged children and the vitality of arts for everyone. And we seek to add value by focusing initiatives where, we, where the leverage of our assets is greatest, helping our grantee partners build capacity and create and disseminate new knowledge. Uh, one of our four major areas of research and funding is in helping to provide youth opportunities for after school arts learning. And it's within that sphere that the Youth Arts Initiative lives. This initiative was conceived as a market test of whether the 10 principles from Something to Say report, of which I was a co-author, uh, could be applied in non-arts focused national youth serving organizations, such as a Y or a Boys and Girls Club. And the Designing for Engagement report is the second major public, re public report that was published from this initiative. Um, within Wallace, we, we have this dual uh, goal, we try to uh, obtain benefits that are both local in terms of how they help uh, our grantees, but it's also important that the learning that takes place on the initiative uh, can be applied to the entire field. And so this report is in service of that dual goal to provide both local benefits and field benefits. Today's webinar is going to be organized by topic. The three topics are recruitment, engagement and benefits. And within each topic, we're gonna follow a structure where our principal investigators will present the top level research findings. Um, and then we will uh, tee up some questions for Ben and Vidal on implementation lessons and insights. And then uh, at that point, we'll have some time allocated for questions from webinar participants. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy McClanahan to provide an overview of the initiative and the research framework. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Peter said, the Youth Arts Initiative was designed to explore if the 10 principles, which as Peter mentioned, were derived in part from the best practices of community arts organizations, could be implemented in multi-service youth development organizations such as the Boys and Girls Club. Both types of organizations want youth to thrive socially, emotionally, and cognitive. So there are similarities there, but there are also notable differences between the two types of organizations. For instance, with respect to breadth versus depth, clubs offer youth multiple programs to explore, whereas arts-focused organizations focus on youth development solely through the arts. Similarly, in clubs, they are staffed by youth development specialists. So they're generalists and they can work in many different types of program areas. And they're also frequently part-time. However, in community arts programs, they offer programming for a smaller number of youth and are staffed by professional artists. So these are the 10 principles that were derived from Peter and his colleagues' research. And they're listed here, including five art-specific principles, such as using professional practicing teaching artists, 
and having uh, dedicated and inspiring art spaces, culminating events, and also high expectations. But there are also five principles that include more traditional youth development ideals, such as positive youth and uh, youth adult relationships, youth voice, and hands-on activities. So the structure of YAI, recognizing that it was different from other club programming, Wallace Foundation provided a grant for YAI directly to the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, uh, BGCA, we will call them, to pilot the Youth Arts Initiative, just to see if it could be, in fact, done, if these principles would work in this multi-service environment. BGCA ran a competitive RFP process to select three pilot clubs. You'll see them listed here. And these clubs were clubs that were committed to the arts, but had not yet developed a high quality art skills development program. So for instance, Milwaukee had an art department that supported programming across its various clubhouses, but didn't have professional teaching artists or feature other aspects of high quality arts programming. Each club implemented four art forms. One professional practicing teaching artist was selected per art form and taught that art forms class. So YAI's pilot brought four new staff members in the form of practicing professional teaching artists to each of the clubs. Lastly, in the pilot, YAI targeted tweens ages 10 to 14. YAI had two or offered two different types of classes. The first are skills development classes. These classes were designed to teach tweens artistic skills. They were taught by teaching artists. They had high expectations, including an attendance commitment, and they worked in those classes towards a culminating event. These skills development classes were offered at least two times per week, and each class offered, uh, I'm sorry, served between eight and 18 youth. Clubs had to enlist the support of parents um, in the skills development um, classes because typical club programs don't have an attendance requirement. The second type of programming um, or classes were exposure classes, and these were more similar to typical club programs. Youth could drop in, and try out the class or the art form that didn't require an attendance commitment. Skill development youth also use these open studio hours or exposure class hours to practice or complete the start work they had started in their skills development classes. The exposure classes were also taught by a teaching artist and they were also taking place in studios that were built out for the purpose of the Youth Arts Initiative, but they were more similar to typical club programs. In YAI's pilot, there were three different types of art forms, and we're using a categorization here that was generated from the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. So there were performing arts classes. In, in the pilot, these were all dance classes. There were visual arts classes, so three of the art forms, or four of the art forms, um, sorry, three of the art forms were visual arts classes. They were painting, things like painting, drawing, and mural arts. And the remainder of the classes were offered in the digital arts, and these were classes such as graphic design, digital music, filmmaking, and also fashion design. So next we're gonna move on and talk about our first research goal, which Peter uh, talked about before in terms of the structure of our presentation today. So our first goal was to determine if the 10 principles could be implemented in a multi uh, program youth serving organization. And our first report, um, Raising the Bar and Stretching the Canvas, reports out on those findings. Um, this report is available on the Wallace Foundation's um, website as well as Research for Action and McClanahan Associates websites. So we found that YAI, um, an art skill development program guided by the 10 principles, could successfully be implemented in a multi-program youth serving organization. Clubs hired professional practicing teaching artists for all of the classes to lead them, and teen, tweens really appreciated these expert instructors. Youth in the YAI classes created original artwork compared to the arts and crafts they had done in previous club art classes, and even though arts had not been key program areas for these clubs prior to YAI, club leaders figured out how to advocate for the arts and for YAI 
even among their multiple other program areas. However, it's important to note that there was a learning curve for these clubs and that certain adaptations had to happen in order for YAI to be successful. So next, we're gonna move on to our second research report, the focus of our conversation today. It's called Designing for Engagement, also available on all three of those websites. And it's the one we're gonna talk most about today. The goal of the research that we did for um, the Designing for Engagement uh, report was to explore first if tweens were interested in the Youth Arts Initiative or YAI, and if so, how did the clubs attract them to it? The second was, were they engaged? Were tweens engaged in the programming and did they stay involved in it over time? And our last uh, area of interest was to explore if the implementation of YAI added value to the clubs and to participating tweens. And as we're going to go over in our next uh, hour together, the answer to all of those questions is yes. So the first question we had was about whether or not tweens were interested in YAI. Did they actually want to learn art skills in a high quality program defined by the 10 principles? When, why would they want to do it when there were so many other great programs to choose from at the club? We found that tweens were in fact interested in YAI and the Youth Arts Initiative. Uh, over the course of the period of the pilot, which ran from February 2014 through fall 2016, 1,280 tweens participated in the Youth Arts Initiative. And the Youth Arts Initiative's enrollment tracked upwards over the course of the initiative. The overwhelming majority of YAI participants were current club members. This wasn't particularly surprising to us since the goal of YAI was to increase access to high quality art skill development and clubs were selected in part because the youth they served were low income and did not have access to these types of programs in their communities. So it was really that um, the clubs were offering something that kids couldn't necessarily get in other areas and so they were very interested in the Youth Arts Initiative. In order to um, cultivate youth interest, club staff um, and teaching artists use a variety of strategies. The bulk of uh, tweens in the Youth Arts Initiative heard about YAI through word of mouth from peers, club staff, and the professional practicing teaching artists. This was the most common way they heard about YAI. In fact, just under a third of youth reported in the research that the teaching artist was the first way they heard about YAI. Um, the professional practicing teaching artist spent time in the clubs getting to know the young people. Club staff and teaching artists also used other recruitment strategies directed towards club youth and their parents, including flyers developed by the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Clubs also integrated YAI into their existing club-wide external recruitment efforts, and YAI made some efforts at external recruitment in the surrounding club community, for example, through presentations in schools. Data from the research showed that youth were attracted to YAI because of the teaching artists, because of the space and because of the equipment. And culminating arts, all, culminating events also made the arts very uh, visible in the clubs. So with respect to the teaching artists, these teaching artists were real professionals in a field um, and that really made the tweens want to learn from the teaching artists. They wanted to be near them and the teaching artists commanded respect and were serious about teaching the art form. And the teaching artists also had the wow factor that tweens wanted that um, Peter and his colleagues talked about in Something to Say. Secondly, with respect to dedicated art space, the art spaces in the Youth Arts Initiative in the clubs were special. They were designed with tween input and were comfortable to relax in and um, learn art skills in, and they were also inspiring for tweens. Furthermore, there was a lot of new equipment in the spaces and this caught tweens attention and made them want to check out the art classes. Lastly, culminating events made the arts visible in the clubs and attracted tween interest. Clubs would showcase youth artwork at both internal and external events like family nights and public community showcases. Last uh, point we'd like to make about um, recruitment and uh, recruitment into YAI is um, about uh, exposure classes and the value of exposure classes or open studio hours um, to recruitment. 
So exposure classes were also used to recruit youth both within and sometimes outside of the clubs. About a quarter of the tweens who participated in YAI skill development class participated in exposure class first. Interestingly, exposure classes proved to be a sound strategy for exposing boys to performing and digital arts, and that's what's shown here on this figure. As you can see in the table, boys comprised a minority of YAI participants in the performing and digital arts, the top two rows and um, the first and last columns. However, in the second set of rows, you can see that boys were more likely to try out digital arts and dance through exposure classes, but not as frequently choose to enroll in skills development rates uh, classes at rates as high as girls. So there were more girls across YAI than boys, but exposure classes really gave boys an important opportunity to come and test out and get a feel for the art form and the youth arts initiative classes. Thanks, Wendy. For everyone who is listening into the webinar, if you have questions uh, about recruitment, this would be a good time to enter them into Q&A. And while those are coming in, and Amy is sorting through them, uh, Ben and Vidal, a couple of questions for you. Uh, first to Ben from Green Bay. Uh, as, as someone who seeks to help kids find their passion across a range of programs, could you speak to what was effective in building enthusiasm and an effective recruitment strategy for art and YAI, and whether that program or, or that those approaches changed over the the three and a half years that YI has been up and going in Green Bay? Yeah, um, you know, as, as it is with any new program or initiative, uh, you know, it comes with some challenges. Um, our members, as most young people, are extremely, you know, creatures of habit. Um, in the club movement, we, you know, we say they vote with their feet. And peer social groups play a huge role in their choices, in, and especially with tweens, which was the, the target uh, we were looking at. Um, early on to build enthusiasm, we began the whole process with having some excitement revolving around having teens be involved in the very beginning early aspects, uh, the selection of the art forms, the design of the actual art spaces, even the hiring process of the teaching artists through interviews and workshops. Um, Somewhat so through the curriculum, you know, once we've started uh, having them involved in some of the programmatic direction um, and having programs be youth driven. So that builds up a lot of enthusiasm and excitement. Uh, many times the teaching artist has a, has a general idea of the destination of the program and the club members, you know, assist in, in the route to get there, uh, which, you know, gives them a lot of buy in. Um, this brings in uh, the enthusiasm, the ownership of the program and the space. Uh, these were these were special, unique programs and uh, and the spaces. So at times, members we did see sometimes members be a little overprotective, you know, because there's limited seats and and they want uh, those lower class ratios. So we did see them be a little bit overprotective at times. Many times we found that the the YI program spaces and the staff turned out to be a safe haven for newer members, quieter members, maybe some that are less social, uh, and, and educating the rest of the staff was super important because we wanted staff to feel comfortable and educated to refer kids to that program. So um, uh, uh, what we found is that the relationship helped make uh, newer, less social, social members have a better early experience, and eventually these members would uh, rotate out into the club. Uh, much of our initial focus was internal for members that we already knew would be invested in benefit. We saw little return on external recruitment efforts such as flyers and school visits, community events. More of that turned into educating folks on what we were doing with new members, parents, guardians uh, coming through for an, uh, initial tours um, that may be on the fence of sending their kids to the club. The YAI ended up turning to be a huge selling point and proof of the club investment in program quality. Uh, and like Wendy said earlier, you know, initially the new space, the new technology, the new staff, all the attention that came with the initiative was a boost right away. As that kind of tapered away, we really looked at tangible products, the culminating events, uh, uh, field trips and arts exposure trips, guest speakers. 
And that really kept the excitement going and, and really we focused on peer to peer and having members recruit their friends to the program. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Vidal, uh, our, our teaching artist on the call over, over to you, the, uh, the direct recruitment, when you just spoke about was one of the more successful, uh, most successful recruitment strategies. Can you describe the specifics of successful recruitment by teaching artists and, and maybe also touch on the peer to peer that Wendy mentioned? Uh, and, and lastly, uh, boys were less likely to participate than girls. Was there anything you did differently to recruit boys into the arts programs? Yeah, to um, speak to the direct recruitment um, and like being hired on, uh, the initiative uh, was very important to me to succeed as one of the kids that grew up in the inner city in Milwaukee. And um, really knowing where a lot of them were coming from and they do vote with their feet. Uh, I made it a point to meet them where they were initially. So uh, before I actually did any drawing or painting or even planning of those activities with the youth and uh, trying to recruit them that way, I actually went to the gym to shoot around with the young men and uh, to play soccer and, and, and play the games with them and just meet them as the person they are so they can meet me as a person before they find out like a title or what my goal is or my responsibility is there. I went to the games room. I went to the cafeteria and I just, uh, and this was a while. I actually, uh, twice a week for about two or three weeks, I actually just went into the environment and enjoyed the environment with the kids and met them. And um, I recruited them through being a good person to them. And they wanted to hear more about my uh, story and how I became an artist and uh, opportunities that I can provide for them through this art program. And that was one of the major recruitments. I actually just became a, a person that they could talk to, a person they uh, looked up to uh, fairly quickly just by being a kind person to them. And in a lot of these environments, they're moving from place to place. They're part of a rotation and now you do arts and now you do gym and now you do games room. And those, those things, I, I just floated around with them. And, and, and I seen the issues that they have with other programs. I seen the things they really enjoyed about other programs. So the recruitment was uh, very strategic on my end initially um, to start the entire program. And as things got to flowing, um, to maintain uh, like uh, new students and, and excitement, uh, peer to peer was the major uh, driving point for that. That was um, a, a young man bringing his uh, friend in, and uh, I'd have incentives for them. If you have a friend that signs up for more than two weeks, you get this like uh, drawing set, or uh, you'll get a little bit more like uh, time to work on something personal while we're doing our assignments, things like that. So I kind of incentivized them to bring somebody that would fit the environment. Um, and they were really keen on creating an environment and having ownership of it. We were doing murals in the room almost instantly. And the kids really knew, like they, they really know who kind of fits those kind of uh, environments. I got a friend that does drawings nonstop. He would love it here. He's kind of antisocial, but uh, you respect that. I don't make kids do anything they're absolutely uncomfortable with. I try to um, get them to work together and that actually uh, helps them quite a bit in recruitment. They find kids that they want to be around and they invite them in. So that was a major part of recruitment. And for the young men, especially, it's, it's me shooting around with them in the gym. It's me being a really... Uh, down to earth person to them and in Milwaukee there's a huge like stigma of, uh with fine arts being uh more feminine I don't really understand it but it's a thing so it had to be addressed so I just really met them where they were at and just talked to them I uh, talked about how art uh is everywhere it's in the LeBron James shoes they're wearing it's in the uh Jordans they're wearing it's in the clothes they're wearing it's in the design of uh the headphones that they're using like everywhere so I really 
showed them that art was everything and everywhere. So the young men felt uh, a lot more comfortable coming in and not having this like um, thing in their head that says it's not for them. I made it for everyone. And I mean, everyone. And uh, they really, they really took to that. Great. Thanks, Vidal. Amy, uh, I see there are uh, a bunch of questions coming in. If uh, Vidal and Ben are ready for the lightning round, um, you can you can start asking now. Sure. Um, one of the questions that has come in is a question about recruiting. Um, how long did it take to recruit enough students to begin skill development classes? Would that be for me? Sure. <laughs> you want to take it, Vidal? Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, so for me, I think I, I, I pretty much got to the number uh, when I started. I started the skill session once I got the number, and that's that's where it was different. I had that leeway to not start a skill session until I had the number of kids I wanted to start with, and um, I believe that was the best approach because it was more realistic of how the class would go. I didn't want any drop off because the environment wasn't really ready to start. So if we had uh, five kids that were very interested and some that weren't, it could have really harmed the program to start it before it was actually going to be what it was gonna be. It, it would really kind of jade the process for the young people if they were kind of coming into this and, uh, like I said, they, they're really social. So if, if it looked like other people weren't interested, it may backfire in that way. So I actually got to recruit until I got to a set number that made sense for me. Great. Um, another question, if we have time for it, um, Peter, do we have time? Yes. Okay. Um, the exposure classes, the question is about the exposure classes. It sounds like they could have been challenging to facilitate. Um, what was the teaching artist feedback on this? And was the, what was the structure of these exposure classes? Was there a curriculum? Vidal, it sounds like that one's for you too. Yeah, um, for me, the exposure classes was uh, similar to how I function as an artist in running an open studio. It's where they got to come in and test out the materials as far as like some small examples of painting, drawing, uh, some examples of building with like found objects, uh, hot glue guns, things like that. So the exposure classes were not necessarily harder to facilitate. I just kind of had to orchestrate them quite a bit and I ran them a little bit more uh, Montessori style where there's a station for a uh, small sculpture making, a station for painting, a station for drawing, and like a, a little social station where you could just sketch and, and conversate with the, the rest of your peers. So it wasn't necessarily challenging if it was uh, kind of handled correctly. And I feel like I, I did a pretty good job of uh, providing several opportunities while they come in so they can find what uh, art form they gravitated towards. So the uh, exposure class helped me quite a bit. Uh, and then I kind of had to reel them back into the like skill sessions. Like you, you don't always get to do what you want, but this is a great way to be in a program in which you will eventually get to do what you want. Great, thank you. Um, a last question for this. Um, this round of Q&A, there'll be more opportunities to ask questions. Um, were there any other incentives offered for participation? Um, swag, access to special events, experiences, uh, anything else? Is that ben, also for me? Yeah, I mean, Ben, Ben, if you, if you wanna take a stab at this. Yeah, I, I, I can jump in. Um, yeah, there was always incentives for participation um, and, and attendance as, as well as behavior. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about uh, um, attendance later. Um, but yeah, everything from ending Fridays with uh, certain activities. We use field trips 
and arts exposure field trips as a big incentive, sometimes as culminating events for kids to look forward to, you know, everything from small little free time, pizza parties, um, uh, different types of events. You know, we've got we've got a, a, a video gaming system with virtual reality that is an incentive for kids to attend and get their work done throughout the week. So, uh, you know, depending on the art form, depending on the teacher and their skill set, um, yeah, we use any and uh, every uh, possible tool to incentivize kids showing up and not just showing up, but actually completing projects. Vidal, did you want to add anything to that? Anything? I know you mentioned the incentives for bringing your friend along, but anything else that you did, either in terms of allocating your time or, or anything in or outside the club that served as an incentive to recruit? Yeah, um, I, I incentivized quite a bit uh, based on the topic. So little painting kits, drawing kits, things like that. Because one of the major things is uh, a lot of these kids don't have access to these things outside of the room. So they're always trying to like take markers and pencils. Can I have this little paint? I swear I'll bring it back. All that kind of stuff. Uh, so I just really uh, got little paint kits from our, our local like supply store and uh, with little canvases. And I incentivized that way. So there was still work being produced, but also... Um, uh, events like oh, we were painting live with uh, the Milwaukee Bucks and uh, depending on your participation and how uh, well you handle projects, uh, obviously we had a limited number of kids that could participate and only the ones who were really trying to build the program through recruitment and through uh, uh, working at a high level were able to do those things that were uh, on the news, they were in articles all around the city. So it was a huge recruitment and even retention and growth uh, factor to incentivize by these major projects, uh, major like public exposure and um, like some take home uh, material so that they can create on their own. Cause uh, there's, there's nothing better than an incentive that's uh, for the kids and for the program. Right, that's a really good point. The Boys and Girls Clubs of America had a, a marketing toolkit to help the local clubs use the initiative, uh, bring it to local press, and really try to generate some excitement in local media for each of the clubs. And I think the clubs were really successful in getting the word out to media and getting a lot of kids featured um, in newspapers and in some cases local TV. We're going we're gonna to switch over to the engagement portion now. So I want to pass the mic over to Tracy Hartman to summarize the research findings on engagement. Uh, please continue to use the Q&A box to uh, send out some questions. And we'll come back to Ben and Vidal in just a couple minutes. Tracy? OK, thanks. So our second research question asked whether youth were engaged uh, and participating regularly in the skill development classes of YAI. And this was an important question because the impact of an out-of-school time program is directly related to the frequency with which young people attend, as well as the duration, the length of time that they stay connected to the program. Um, but we also know other research in out-of-school time has shown that participation in out-of-school time programs declines as youth get older for obvious reasons. They have more autonomy and more choices about what to do after school. As Ben said, they vote with their feet. Um, and they have more responsibilities as their schoolwork gets more challenging, there's more homework, they might be babysitting siblings, et cetera. So there's lots of competing interests after school and it's harder to get this population of students engaged. So it was an important question to find out if YAI was able to engage them um, and then if so, how. Our research found that yes, YAI did generate a high level of engagement among youth um, in the clubs. And by engagement, we mean that youth enjoyed the program, they were interested in the activities, and they were willing to be pushed or challenged in the program. And so we know this from our observations of programs in which um, we observed that for the most part, youth were very focused and on task in class, and they were willing to put forth that effort to learn from the teaching artists. In addition, we heard from youth that they were excited to go to the program, um, and as the quote on the slide 
um, illustrates from one participant, you know, they, they really felt like it was one of the best things they were doing. We heard that across art forms, across, across clubs. We also heard from parents that the youth came home and talked about the program. They were very excited about it. And club staff told us that youth would wait outside the door of the studio for the teaching artists to come and open the door. So there was a lot of um, indicators that youth were very engaged in this program. And so it's not surprising then that they were participating regularly. And um, regular participation in this case refers to attendance one day a week or more, which is the definition of regular attendance used by Boys and Girls Clubs of America. We also looked at youth who came two days a week or more and we considered them to be high intensity participants. Um, and as a reminder, the programs, the Youth Arts Initiative Skill Development Programs took place two days a week. Um, and then they also had a third opportunity to participate each week, which was open studio. So there was a total of three opportunities per week. And the table displays the percentage of youth who were both regular and high intensity participants overall and by art form. And if you look at the bottom row overall, you can see 58% of the Youth Arts Initiative participants came one day a week or more, um, and 32% came two days a week or more. But then you can also see some, some variation by art form. So, uh, performing arts students, 66% were coming one day a week or more, and 39% were coming two days a week or more. The percentage of regular and high intensity participants was a little bit lower for the other two art forms, um, but overall still encouraging considering the difficult uh, difficulty of attracting or retaining tweens um, in OST programs. Even more impressive though was the fact that 60% 60, 60 of the students who participated over the course of the year returned to the Youth Arts Initiative programs the next year. So 60%, um, regardless of their level of participation in a given uh, year, 60% came back the next year to uh, again re-engage with YAI classes. So that um, again was very encouraging in terms of uh, their engagement and participation. So why um, why was the Youth Arts Initiative engaging for this age group? What was it about the programs that kept them involved? Um, first, it was the strong youth development practices that were identified by the 10 principles. Um, these included, uh, in particular, four of the principles. Um, principle six is adult youth relationships and positive peer relationships. Principle seven was youth input and leadership opportunities. Principle eight was hands-on activities with current equipment and technology, and principle 10 was physical and emotional safety. So teaching artists told us that these four principles were really key to the engagement of participants in the program. If they didn't have that strong positive relationship, if there wasn't a positive environment among the peers in the program, um, if they didn't have hands-on activities, or opportunities to align to youth interest in the program, or if the program wasn't physically or emotionally safe, they, they just couldn't retain youth in the program. And we heard the same thing from young people, um, but in a different, uh, from a different perspective, these, these four principles were kind of deal breakers for them. If there were lapses in implementation in these four areas, one of these four areas, they might lose interest in the program. So these four principles were really key to keeping youth engaged. But in addition, the Youth Arts Initiative um, had uh, high expectations and particularly had an expectation of attendance, an attendance commitment. Um, so this was true across all the art forms, across all clubs, that youth were expected to attend each skill development session every time it was offered. Artists handled this expectation differently. There was a variation in how strict they were about it. But um, we know that this, aspect of the program really differentiated it from the other programs in the club which were more drop-in uh, oriented. So when we talked to other club staff and when we talked to youth themselves, they described YAI as the program that youth had to commit to. So that was a distinguishing feature of it. Um, and as Wendy mentioned earlier, clubs found that this commitment aspect really required parent engagement um, because, for example, um, early on when um, the programs were, were uh, early on parents were used to coming to pick up their children on the way home from work for example and youth might be right in the middle of a skill development session and they'd have to be pulled out so it really required some conversation with parents around why is it important that they stay for this period of time and why is it important that they be here for every session and parents bought into the program partly because they observed the high level of engagement that their children um, had in the program and they were really excited to see their child so excited about something 
And they also, uh, once they had the opportunity to uh, attend a culminating event and, and to observe what their children were learning and um, see these great opportunities they were having to share their skills with, uh, you know, in a public setting with a larger audience, they, they really bought in, they were sold on the program and they were, and they were definitely um, willing to support the attendance commitment. <clears throat> a third factor that was contributing to engagement um, something we call sparks, and this is a term that comes from the Search Institute, and it refers to a motivating interest or a passion. Um, and in this case, it was a, an interest or passion for the arts. So uh, some youth came to the Youth Arts Initiative with this existing interest in the art form, and other youth were developing it along the way. And in the focus groups we had with youth over time, more and more we were hearing from them that their reason for continuing to come to the program was because they liked the art form. They really wanted to learn more. They had specific things they wanted to learn. Um, and they, you know, they really enjoyed the art form itself. And parents told us they were um, taking the art form home with them and practicing at home. So it became something that uh, in and of itself was motivating, inherently motivating for them. There were some barriers for uh, tweens in participating in uh, YAI programs and clubs were able to address some of these, but not all. Um, the first one was competing programs. Uh, as has been mentioned um, already in the presentation, there's a lot going on uh, in the Boys and Girls Clubs and youth have lots of opportunities. Um, so club leaders realized that they had to manage the schedules so that they uh, did not create competition between the Youth Arts Initiative and other high interest programs for this age group. And they wanted uh, young people to be able to participate, to have a holistic experience in the club. So they had to manage the schedule to not create that kind of competition. There were also growing pains in the program. As the program got bigger, there were more youth participating and sometimes large group sizes could be challenging for the group management skills of the teaching artists. But also they began to have youth of different skill levels in the program. Initially, uh, the vast majority of youth participating in YAI were beginners in the art form. But over time, they developed a core group of students who had more skills. Um, and so it, there were tensions around having the beginners and the more advanced students in the same program. And the clubs uh, addressed this by creating two different tiers of programming, one, you know, one for more advanced students and one for beginners. Um, a third barrier, as was mentioned earlier, was just the other responsibilities and other commitments that middle school youth have. So they had homework after school, um, students told us they had sports practice, they had babysitting, they had other things going on after school that sometimes took them away from YAI and that was harder for the clubs to address um, in terms of keeping youth consistent in, the, um, in YAI. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, so a couple of implementation questions. Let's start with, uh, Vidal, and again, if you have questions about engagement, please share them in the Q&A box. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, Vidal, could you speak about the role of culminating events and retaining, focusing, and motivating the, the young people in your program? And how did you design and time the culminating events so that they were tools to motivate and retain kids? I know that the, the various programs did a lot of experimentation with the culminating events in terms of frequency and how big and different art forms. So maybe speak about how you use that strategically to keep kids engaged. Yeah, for the culminating events, um, it, it just really started from a place of uh, let's get what you're doing out there, uh, making the work of the work worth it, meaning uh, to show it and, and really have the kids have a chance to articulate what they've learned in the class um, makes it really like academic, but beyond the role of the um, arts education of it, uh, the culminating events became more of how to share out how well the program is going with the larger community not just the club that they're in, they're not creating things and putting them on a poster uh, board in, in the hallway. They're actually doing murals out in the neighborhood on the sides of buildings. Uh, we're doing installations of sculptures. Uh, we're working with a, a major NBA team. We're doing many things that uh, should be seen. And for the youth, one of the major uh, 
factors uh, was timing, meaning uh, when we did the culminating event, what day of the week, what time of the day, and uh, and that was to get the parents engaged because th these are kids. They they a lot of the youth that I work with, they they're not able to get up in the morning and make decisions on where they go, when, and how. So we we had to really engage the parents, and this was a way to do so. So uh, opposed to doing something on a Thursday afternoon where we know most of the parents are working, we're doing it on a, a Sunday uh, late afternoon or, or uh, a Saturday late afternoon so that we can time it so the parents can be there, so that the staff can support them in ways that are beyond their job, uh, because a lot of them build really strong relationships with their uh, mentors, and they would love to come to your show at this thing, but I'm actually on the clock, so I can't leave work to go support you. So we had to do a lot of thinking about timing and where they were. A lot of our uh, shows end up being off-site in, uh, in galleries and different studios around the city. So it made sense for staff to be able to get there. Um, we get to control the environment. So the event really had an impact on everyone viewing it. So the culminating events were for the kids to be able to see how important they were, how important what they were doing was. And that, that always drove them to continue next season. That always drove them to how could we do better? How could we uh, get more people at our show? How could I sell like more artwork? How could I, um, how could I really explain the process better? So those things all happen within the youth. But beyond that, the, the club started to really I don't like to use the term buy-in, but they really started to support what the youth were doing, not just as here are some kids doing some like cool art things. Like these are career path um, opportunities. A lot of young people learn how to write up their own proposals as far as how to budget for materials, what kind of treatment different walls needed or different surfaces that you paint on from canvas to panel. So they were learning all these things and showing people that they knew how to do these things. Uh, not just people who would just pat them on the back regardless, but the public. Like these, Some of the shows were walk-in. Anyone from the neighborhood could walk into these shows. They were well-staffed, so the kids were safe. These were safe environments. These were uh, galleries and studios with great reputations in the city. Even work at the Milwaukee Art Museum. So they were really able to engage in a broader audience with what they've learned, what skills they've picked up, and also build that confidence that what they're doing matters to not just me as an instructor or just the people that are paid to be around them. This is people who are spending their time and their day to come look at the work you've produced and, and ask you questions about it in a very curious way, which adds to the kids' curiosity. And uh, it really, it really helped me maintain a strong group of kids throughout my uh, tenure, and it's been, it's been an amazing recruitment and retention, and uh, public-facing uh, uh, engagement for me. Thanks, Vidal. Uh, ben, over to you. This was a, an interesting question. How did you manage the challenge of skill-based? program with an attendance requirement in an organization with a drop-in culture because Boys and Girls Clubs traditionally welcome everyone on their own terms and yet this program had some requirements that were a little bit uh, cut against the grain of the culture. So how, how, how was that managed in the club? Yeah, this uh, this was an interesting one because you're right, Peter. We do have the long, you know, philosophy and tradition of being drop in, and you know this, you know, this initiative is you know project product performance based. So, um, you know, a couple things that we attempted, and and more so just some of our learning curve, and some of it Tracy touched on as well. But we were caught off a little bit off guard, uh, thinking that internal club program competition and options would play a larger factor in regards to you know, the announcements and the field trips and the program areas opening up, but we really found that wasn't the case. And actually through RFA's data, um, they reported out that 
you know, for the most part, if kids made it to the club, they were attending YAI classes. Um, I, so we found out we really underestimated the external uh, competition for time, you know, the sports, the babysitting, the church, switching school, sometimes transportation was the issue. Uh, oddly enough, sometimes, you know, our parents or guardians were using taking the club away as a punishment. And uh, so, so we ha- found it hard to have a real hard line in the sand when it came to those expectations. Um, we looked at addressing some of these issues in a couple of ways. Like Tracy had mentioned, family engagement was huge. And, and we switched that term uh, it more from parent engagement because of the large amount of non-traditional household settings we see. We found that that term a little bit more accurate. Um, but getting families into the spaces, teaching artists, you know, uh, I've had teaching artists stop cars and parking lots to, to touch base with parents, um, you know, inviting them uh, in to special events, sending home artwork really um, helped communicate the importance of attendance and the uniqueness of this initiative. So we saw a really good increase in uh, attendance and buy-in by, by just simply educating the parents of what this was. Um, you know, establishing the attendance expectations was, was also, you know, a, a challenge. After school is different than summer, you know, the, the, depending on the, the length of your program sessions, we were running for six weeks and we were running for 10 weeks. Some programs run for an hour Monday through Thursday, some run two hours every Monday and Wednesday. Um, sometimes the art form itself can, can affect uh, even establishing your attendance expectations. There's far that you can catch up if you're behind. However, a lot of like performance-based or, or project-based, you know, if you're behind, uh, you're not able to catch up. So we found that we had to be extremely flexible knowing that many times missing class was out of their control. And, and if it was in their control and a conscious effort to miss class, that's something that we handled differently. Um, originally, the concept of open studio was uh, looking at recruitment and what we called, you know, trying to attract dabblers who wanted to just try it out. However, we found success in having open studio uh, be meant for makeup classes, one-on-one time for artists, for young artists who might be struggling and falling behind, one-on-one time for those artists, young artists that are excelling and, and might need more attention from a teaching artist. Uh, we saw open studios used for independent work and side projects. So um, another adjustment that was made was the emphasis on not just attending and showing up. You know, it, it's easy to walk through the door and check a box and say you're there. Doesn't doesn't mean a whole lot when it comes to behavior in the classroom and actual work getting done. So along with attendance, we were tracking behavior and and completion of projects. You know, a, a member who attends every single day, but really wasn't putting in much effort versus a member who by no means of their own can only come half the time, but is, is, is working super hard and completing projects had to be considered when we look at, looked at establishing and, and enforcing really uh, attendance expectations. Great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I see we have uh, quite a few more than a couple dozen open questions. Amy, do you want to, Go ahead and tease some of those up, and then Ben and Vidal, I'd also ask you uh, when you're not speaking, maybe to uh, try and get in and answer some of these as well privately, because I don't think we're going to get to all of them. Uh, but go ahead, Amy. Sure. Um, were there any formal or informal youth leadership opportunities within the program? And if so, did you notice any difference in engagement in program that had youth leadership opportunities? So how did youth leadership opportunities influence engagement? I, I'll, I'll jump on in first, and then if Vidal, you want to add. Um, we, we, we looked along the line of a lot of our kids, especially as the program went on and they started to age up, we were looking for, you know, as our tweens turned into teens, wanting them to come in and have a leadership role, co-facilitate. And what we really found out is, at least for us, they really didn't want to do that. They wanted to continue working on their art, and uh, that's where a lot of our independent projects and uh, side projects came in, where a lot of our older teens that weren't uh, interested in co-facilitating or being a leader in the room wanted to come in and continue working on their art projects and independent projects or just stay within class. So um, we didn't see a ton of that leadership, per se, um, in that aspect. 
Yeah, for um, for my programs in Milwaukee, uh, I'd say uh, one of the sites uh, had uh, the leadership's roles go well. Uh, other sites, not as much because there wasn't as much uh, depth in the program. But when there was, uh, the youth that have been there for like years now, it sounds crazy to say, but yeah, for years, they they know the ropes so well. And I, and I run the programs pretty uh, Montessori style. They always understood like the stations or the several projects that were going on at once. So it made it a lot easier for me to orchestrate when uh, I have two or three uh, youth in the room who know what we're doing, why we're doing it, where every bit of material is, how to clean off the brushes. So they did play quite a role, but their leadership uh, came in uh, more as uh, making the, the program function better, not necessarily like now I run this specific project, but more of a, uh, let's make it efficient. Let's get the cleanups done uh, faster so we have more time to work. Uh, while a kid coming in late, they'll catch them up really quickly to what options they have as far as working um, or just m minor techniques here and there. But they did really like to do their own work uh, as they reached that status, but they were very helpful in making things go a lot more efficiently because I'm not having to pause and catch people up because it is a drop-in uh, program. So they were really um, great at just getting people right in the mix of things like as far as uh, the flow of the classes, the flow of the projects where I didn't have to constantly pump, pump the brakes so I could catch every individual up that missed a day or came a little late. And that's where their role really um, helped the program and where they really excelled as far as leaders. Thanks, Amy. Do we have a couple, we have time for two more uh, before we move on. Do you have a couple more? Okay, great. We have a, a great question about uh, cultural re relevancy. How much did cultural relevancy impact retention for students of color? And how is cultural relevancy prioritized or leveraged to impact retention? Okay. Fidel or Ben or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is Fidel. I, I, I just want to like emphasize that it is uh, paramount to the success of the program. Um, not to say it has to be like this one to one match, but the understanding of culture. And, and values and uh, dynamics of race, culture, even uh, religion and all these factors in life, they play a huge role in how well the instructor is going to be received. Uh, we, we've uh, learned our lesson the hard way in Milwaukee where we did hire on early the, the best photographer and the best uh, animator it did not translate to the best person for the kids. Um, the best person for the kids is the one so that can get them to learn the lesson and have it be a, a relevant subject, uh, relevant content, so that it gives purpose to the skill level. Because you can paint a beautiful flower, but if it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't mean anything. So the youth knows that. And, and it, they're, they're a lot more conscious of the relevancy of a skill than the uh, ability of it. Like, yeah, you can, you can cut wood like a master, but what are you going to make with it? So those, those things uh, really played a major role here in Milwaukee in how the youth were receiving these lessons, these skills, and what they were doing with them. They, they, were, they were gravitating toward projects that had a relevance to their, their families, to their upbringing, to the things they valued. If they valued fashion, they valued hip hop culture and music, these things had to, they had to have some aspects of it. Uh, often uh, instructors like to come in and like uh, put their sense of what's important on the, the field of, of whatever art form it is from drawing, painting, dance. Um, but I found that the person who is most um, 
equipped to communicate well with the kids and that's not like getting to their level but really having a deep communication of understanding like the hardships uh understanding even the little banter like you can kick a kid out for something that may not even be inappropriate because you just don't understand that uh the, the way they they play in some ways and there's there's always being the adult in the room and correcting things when they're wrong but um, often the youth, uh, mainly in the inner city, they're punished for people around them not understanding how things are for them. And it, it's a major role in, in being successful at anything you do with these youth, whether it be arts, sports, academics. Uh, you have to put the right person in front of them, uh, hands down culture and, and race and all that plays a major role in it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's it's paramount to the success of any program that they at least know those things. Vidal, thank you. And we're gonna move on to the last section on benefits and va and value. If I could just ask Wendy and Ben and Vidal to maybe jump in and try to answer a couple of the questions privately, because uh, I'd like everyone who took the time to submit a question to try to get a response, whether we do it to the whole group or we just answer it in the QA box. Uh, please, if each of you could just grab a couple of questions there and to all participants, keep them coming. We're gonna switch over to the, the last section on the, the benefits and value of the, the program. So back to Tracy. Okay, so um, as we've noted um, earlier, these high quality arts programs in clubs could be a little more challenging to offer than a typical arts and crafts program, and they also required more resources. So the question then was, were, were they worth it? What was the value add of these programs for the clubs and for the participants? Our research wasn't designed to rigorously measure youth outcomes. Um, because this was a pilot, our goal was really to find out if the clubs could implement the program, if youth were attracted to it, and if they would attend regularly. But we did gather some exploratory data on the benefits of these programs for the clubs and for youth. So we, uh, we identified a few areas in which YAI uh, added value um, to the clubs and benefited tweens. Um, first, YAI um, increased the tween club participation and retention at the same time uh, as, as in this age range when participation typically declines. Um, for individual youth, we heard that they were experiencing developmentally rich programs, um, which meant that they were exp having experiences in YAI that were important for healthy adolescent development and tweens and their parents and other club staff reported that they were experiencing social and emotional development and were developing artistic skills. So I'll say a little more about each of these now. In terms of uh, participation, um, YAI participants increased their participation and retention in the club compared to club members who were not participating in YAI. And you can see two uh, bar graphs here that display the change in club attendance before YAI started uh, and after it had started for both YAI participants and other club members who did not participate in YAI. One thing you'll see, first of all, in the graph is that YAI participants were high club participators to begin with. Um, you can see, if you look at the graph on the left, 58% of YAI youth were coming to the club one day a week or more before YAI started while only 38% of other club members were coming to the club one day a week or more. However, while they were high, high attenders to begin with, YAI youth increased their participation over time, while the other club members who were not in YAI decreased club attendance. And again, this is the pattern that we see in other research um, at this age, is the decline in participation. In addition, what's not shown on the graph is that YAI participants were more likely re to return to the club in the following year as compared to club members who chose not to participate in YAI. We also heard from parents, uh, from other club staff, and from the youth themselves 
that the youth were benefiting from YAI um, because they were developing social and emotional skills in the program and they were also developing artistic skills. The social and emotional competencies that we heard about fell into three big buckets. Um, the first was self-confidence. And we heard uh, a lot about increased self-confidence from parents, particularly pointing to the experience of youth in the culminating events and having the opportunity to showcase their work. Um, so you can read the quote here from a parent um, that was typical of the quotes that we heard from parents, again, across art forms and across clubs. We also heard from parents that they saw increases and improvements in their child's sense of responsibility and time management. Um, and again, this, they pointed, parents pointed back to a number of things. First, the high expectations of the program, coupled with this relationship that their uh, son or daughter had with the teaching artist, and the high engagement that they had in the program. So the combination of these three things um, was really motivating uh, their child to become more responsible, to manage their time better, so they could be involved in the program and, and take advantage of the opportunities that it offered. And finally, we heard from parents again and from young people that they were developing uh, new friendships and, and just more relationship skills in general. And um, young people and parents pointed to the fact that this was a safe environment. They were able to connect with other youth who had similar interests. And there was a lot of collaborative and group activity that was happening uh, in the program. So it created an environment in which they could uh, develop new friendships and, and develop uh, new skills. The final uh, benefit that youth experienced from the program was uh, beginning to learn art skills. As I mentioned earlier, the youth who participated in YAI were beginners in the art form for the most part. And so they were learning some basic skills of, of learning, you know, techniques of the craft. Um, and they were also learning to use and care for the tools, the materials, and the space of the art form. And so we have two quotes on the slide here that illustrate the kinds of things we heard from young people about what they were learning in the program. Um, so the first quote from a dance participant, you know, kind of illustrates um, the, the level of detail and the, the sophistication they were developing around what it takes to participate um, and to learn dance. Um, and the second quote from a digital music participant is an illustration of the, the tools that they were learning to use in that art form around, in this case it was software. In other art forms in fashion design, they were learning to use the sewing machines and visual arts. They were learning to use uh, the brushes, the paints and all the other materials and how to care for those things. Um, and similarly across art forms, they, they learned how to use cameras um, in the film program, um, et cetera. So they were beginning to develop these skills in the art form. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Tracy. Ben, uh, to you, a question about benefits and value. What changes did you and the other staff members see in the youth who participated in YAI and how did this affect the staff and the club? Um, yeah, and, and I'm gonna piggyback on a couple of things, but you know, obviously we know the arts are good for young people, really all people, but you know, being tasked to measure it and prove it is different. So, you know, you've heard and seen some stats from RFA. Um, we did some local surveys here as well. and. Um, and I think these would stand across the board, but um, we saw in the 90 percentile participants said that they found their voice through art, um, have found something they're good at, helped them stay away from drugs and alcohol, um, helped them stay out of trouble specifically with the law enforcement, um, other powerful stats in the high 80 percentiles, members reported having more self-confidence getting better grades, going to school more often, and um, most importantly, you know, have found meaningful relationships with both peers and positive adults. So, you know, I know, I know these stats hit a lot of different areas, and, and, and that was by design with our, our local survey, but a couple I wanted to point out specifically were um, knowing that there's an emphasis on high quality and skill building, we didn't want to lose track and document, you know, the therapeutic benefits of being involved with the arts, such as you know, the stress relief, uh, addressing past trauma, self-esteem, um, you know, and many of these benefits you can guess, you know, blend in with 
building social skills through collaboration, peer-to-peer -peer critique, and, and just overall uh, uh, communication. One thing we found out, and, and early on I remember reading in the Something to Save report uh, about young people, and more notably their, their parents, looking at athletics as a pathway to college or even career, but never thought about it with the arts. And, you know, you don't need to be a calculator to, to figure out the drastic difference in, in those odds. But um, so we looked at 21st century skills that were transferable to the workplace, exposed youth to um, other professional artists, business owners, colleges, tech schools. And, and now we're seeing many, you know, of these members, and including their guardians, you know, looking at the arts as a secondary education option, even career and and strongly feel that with the background they're getting in YI, these these young people will now have a leg up, and 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 having that leg up will be more likely to succeed. Um, so so the bigger picture, um, culturally how it affected us, YI um, it has become one of our organization's three signature initiatives, along with uh, a graduation initiative and a teen workforce development program. Um, it's made us a player in the local art scene, which, which you know, coming from a drop-in recreational center is, is huge for our status. Um, the 10 success principles helped us look at other program departments to ensure that we're looking at hiring experts, uh, including youth input, uh, physical and emotional safety, and just, just overall program quality. And uh, lastly, one of the more powerful takeaways from my five years of being involved with uh, YI was recently when RFA came to visit and they held a guardian parent focus group. And we had one parent say that they were having a conversation with their sixth grader. And it was about starting school next year at a really good school, closer to home, no transportation issues, or let's say a less prevalent school, closer to the club, um, but they'd have to bus there every morning. Um, and together, they made the decision to come to the, the to go to the school that was closer to club, so they could have access to YI. So you know when you're when you're looking at uh, affecting you know life decisions like that, I think that really shows you know the true impact and influence you know that that the arts and the the club can have on our youth and families. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, we we definitely heard a lot of stories like that when we did our site visits about kids who had been on the periphery and arts really helped bring them out and, and help them connect with kids and adults. Uh, over to you, Vidal. Can you give an example of a kid who developed a spark through YAI and reflect on the strategies and supports that were needed to nurture the spark? Yeah, um, so I I've, I've, uh, have quite a few students and few of them that are really engaged in the arts um, beyond YAI. So the, the spark that YAI has really created in them um, helped them to focus at home. So I have uh, parents that drop in uh, like bi-weekly just, uh, just to show appreciation. Uh, and, and this young lady's uh, daughters become a lot more outspoken as far as um, speaking up for herself, dealing with bullying issues and things like that. And um, the participation in the program and how well she was being respected and how she was encouraged to express herself really um, made it a thing for her beyond the walls of that classroom. And uh, she stopped a lot of things that she didn't like to happen as far as uh, in the school environments uh, from happening just by uh, being able to communicate these things and having a confidence to uh, another young man who uh, draws constantly. He's, he's constantly drawing and, and making art, but um, where that goes uh, for, his, for his mother, she didn't know. Like she, she had no clue, uh, single uh, mother, um, raising a son and he's on the a spectrum and she is as well and it's very very difficult for them to see like the route to success for him um, what ended up happening is through the program um, we worked together a lot on getting together like portfolio uh, work so he could uh, he, he transitioned through the program he transitioned from middle school to high school but he had to audition 
at an art space high school here in Milwaukee, Milwaukee High School of the Arts, and uh, he got in, and he, he that boosted his confidence, and he's uh, a lot more social than he's uh, like ever been, and he he has this like focus um, more so than what other people would describe as the as um, kind of floating like aimless thing. He was amazing at his skills, a great person, but it was just like the, he was the kid in the corner that um, just drew. But now he's like kind of career pathing it in, in a way that uh, the program really sparked where you could go next as far as animating, as far as illustrating and uh, character development, comic strips, all these kind of things that he's doing now and uh, really starting to look at college already a sophomore in high school and he's, he's already uh, putting together portfolio work for college and, and and the young lady as well she's in a girls program learning how to mentor uh, other young girls who deal with uh, issues of bullying and things like that so way beyond the art form uh, it really sparked the the human in the kids that participate in, in a direction and a purpose way beyond what um, parents and staff had, uh, and even themselves has ever seen. And that's that was all built through this constant like evaluation of what they like to do, what they want to do, uh, how to communicate, how to articulate what you want, what you enjoy, what you don't uh, want to do in, in life, what what friends you want around, what kind of conversations you want to have, like the the um, environments you want to be in, like do you want to be downtown, do you want to be uh, out of state, do you, like all these kind of things we, we learn through field trips, exposure trips, uh, art shows, how to prep art shows and how to articulate about your work. Uh, sometimes they stand right in front of the work and take any question that someone asks them. And the confidence that they build in what they're doing and why it's really translated to a spark in life for them. Great, thank you. Thank you, Vidal. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Amy, do you wanna uh, pick some? I know we have a bunch open. Sure, um, this question is for, for Ben. Um, there have been a bunch of questions about hiring uh, teaching artists. And I was wondering if you can speak a little bit about um, your experience with that and some specific tips on, on what to look for. Yeah, um, you know, we cast a, a wide net and, and brought in a lot of folks. Like I said, one of the bigger things was including the youth in part of that process as far as uh, the interviews and, and, and having artists do workshops and really seeing uh, artists uh, on the floor. A big takeaway that that I've spoken a, a couple different times is, you know, you're trying to find an interesting blend of somebody who's an expert in their field, but also uh, can actually teach that. And 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 there's two big differences. You know, there's people who are experts in in, in an arts genre or field, but you know, it it they're not able to teach it. Um, there's people who are excellent teachers, but you know what? They might not be on the level of an expert in that field. So we were really looking at 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 a lot of different options. What we found is just because, like I said, just because you're an expert in the field doesn't mean you can teach it. Just because you've worked with youth and have a background in working with youth doesn't mean that you're any good at it or, or used to working with youth in this type environment or this population. So um, we really looked at the individual. We wanted folks, we were also looking for folks that were versatile. You know, uh, we've got folks on our team that can that can shift gears and aren't aren't cornered into one specific type of performance or graphic design or dance. You know, we were lo really looking for versatility because we know that we want to keep things fresh for the kids. And we know that programs and, and curriculums can change at the drop of a dime. And we wanted to have artistic, creative people that were versatile in those positions. I think that answers it. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, this is a, a pretty broad question for Fidel. Um, though, 
the more specific you can get, the better. Um, in terms of the design and the implementation of programs, what strategies were particularly um, were, were a real hit with this age group? When um, designing the program, uh, well, the major factors were, um, I, I call it the double Dutch approach, is the timing of really putting it in a, a moment of the day or a moment in the moments of the week that there's the least uh, friction. Uh, meaning like uh, when, you, you know, when they get there, they got like uh, this homework help time. So it's not really a great time to start it then. But at the end of the day, their, their interest kind of dwindles and they're getting picked up around like 6.30 or 6 or whatever. So that's not a good time. It's really finding the uh, proper time to do the program in which you're going to get the most engagement. You're going to get the less friction from these outside factors of going home, outside uh, sports or programs or homework help, things like that. And, and uh, to be specific, it's like right after homework help in an after school setting. And uh, definitely before uh, like that about to be picked up time. So for, for us that fell between like 4.30 to around like 5.30, 6 o'clock. And it really helped uh, the program go well. And as far as the design around the program, it started with a really human interaction, a real, how was your day? What, uh, some, tell me something amazing that happened this week. And it, it and it didn't always, I didn't beat them over the head with art. You know, I didn't, I didn't make it like, this is an art class. This is an art class. Like it, it wasn't that, that they were already interested in the art. They were already there. I didn't have to tell them what they were there for in that sense. I just had to show them why they should be there by uh, answering questions about life in some ways, about school, about family, about their, uh, their take on something they've seen, you know, a funny video. So I start each of my days like that, like just introducing the kid to the week and, and, and having them have peer-to-peer -peer contact, but then kind of setting up while we do that. That whole time we're talking, we're getting out the paints, we're getting out the brushes, we're setting up the canvases. So it's not an efficient time. It was time in which we could talk and they felt comfortable in the environment. Then we can dive into the work. And the same thing as we left the room. All right, so what are you guys looking forward to this weekend? And, and uh, make sure you guys look at this uh, cool exhibition if you get a chance or tell your parents about this, like kind of capping off the day, similar to how we start the day with just go out there in the world and have fun, be a great person and um, be creative, think differently. Um, uh, you know, def <laughs> defend people. I mean, that, that's a major thing. They, they they really gravitated towards this really, we're all in this together, um, be comfortable approach to the program. And the arts was the most natural and easiest place for me to teach. But these uh, social skills and in these, uh, these really human ways to break these barriers with the youth, uh, they were more successful at creating these programs how you start your day and how you end your day and uh, what time of day mattered most. And sometimes Fridays didn't work well because they were just amped and ready for the weekend. So maybe a, a Tuesday, Thursday class or a Monday, Wednesday class right after snack and, and homework help where they're not hungry. Uh, they just finished this work. They're ready to have fun. So those were the most successful strategies was to really find the right time in the right moment that uh, you can capitalize on. Vidal, I think that'd be a good place for us to begin to wrap. I want to thank the National Guild for Community Arts Education, our principal investigators, Wendy McClanahan and Tracy Hartman, and uh, you, Vidal Hill, and, and Ben Perkovich, uh, for offering up so many good insights uh, for the other practitioners who are on the call. Thanks to everyone for your questions. Uh, as Drew mentioned, we will try to find a way to get answers to your questions if we didn't get to them. And upon exiting, you'll see a very brief survey 
please answer these questions. They really help us and the Guild to better tailor these kinds of um, webinars around content that's interesting to all of you. Uh, Drew, if, do you have anything else or? Just to extend my thanks as well. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, and as Peter mentioned, there will be a short survey. One of those questions includes how we might deepen and, and further extend this learning. And based on the number of questions, I know uh, that that is something people might be interested in. So please take a moment to reflect on that. Um, and thank you everyone for being here.